a snow crystal. It's a symbol of winter. It's also the logo for this conference. A snow crystal begins its life when some small nucleus causes a droplet to freeze. So it starts as a tiny sphere. But all this order and structure we see here comes from vapor deposition. Formless vapor becomes structured. How does it happen? That's all discussed here. But first, why study snow crystal shape? Vapor deposition is a crucial part of lots of precipitation types. For example, in this diagram from a cloud physics text, it's right smack in the middle. For example, the snow crystals could just fall to the ground unchanged. So this is great for skiers, especially if they're dendrites, but if they're needle crystals, no, it's not so good for traffic. Um, more commonly, though, the, the crystals hit other crystals, become snowflakes, or they hit other droplets, and they, they rhyme. And these things could fall unchanged to the ground, say, becoming a hail or snow grains, or they might melt and become rain. And how these things happen depends on how fast the crystals fall. Crystals of different shape fall differently. This plot shows the fall distance here versus growth time along here. And this interesting thing is that the, uh, the crystals that fall the fastest are these ones that grow the slowest, the isometric, more dense crystals, coming down here at 800 meters in 30 minutes. The slowest falling crystals are the, the dendrites. And uh, these fall slow because they, they grow outward and they fall like a parachute. These fast falling ones have a tendency to become rime. These slow falling uh, dendrites have a tendency to cluster into snowflakes. Light is also crucial for making lightning possible in the thunderstorm. Here we have small light vapor grown crystals carried upward and ricocheting off the heavier rime particles falling down, exchanging charge in the process. This, this electrification is sort of like a Van der Graaff generator. Now, the interesting thing is that the charging depends on growth rate. And this is closely related to the crystal habit. This plot shows that the charge exchange per collision depends on temperature, having a peak charging near minus 14 and minus 15. Um, and uh, this is where the growth rate is the fastest. By the way, this is from two independent experiments in theory. Um, it's also, the, the peak charging is also where the crystal habit is the thinnest. Over here where the, uh, the growth is slower and the crystals are isometric, the charging is almost zero. Habit also affects rate of transfer. In the rate of transfer through high clouds, which are, are mostly ice, has a big impact on climate. We see this habit effect on light scattering vividly in optical displays, like the circumhorizontal arc shown here. Uh, this forms when uh, relatively thin tabular crystals fall slowly, staying almost perfectly horizontal like little flying saucers. Now also, vapor in the upper troposphere is an important greenhouse gas, and the amount of vapor is influenced by the mass uptake to the ice which has a rate that depends on crystal habit. And habit may have chemical effects as well. And there are quite a few other ways, important ways, that atmospheric ice affects what we do and what we experience. But the biggest motivation for studying habit, I think, is curiosity. As researchers, we don't emphasize curiosity in our proposals, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. And people everywhere. Even people who have never walked on snow or felt a crystal melt on their skin are curious about the dendrite. Here are, here are two types. You should have no trouble identifying which one is the snow dendrite. The snow dendrite has a lot more order. It has these straight crystalline edges, more symmetry, more internal structure. Now this other type here, now this one here is a ice crystal that grew from liquid near zero. Um, uh, this is studied a lot more heavily, uh, I think because it's uh, common to other materials. 
In fact, it was in a seminar like this that first got me interested in snow. Um, the speaker was talking about this type of dendrite and uh, was focused on, on some little detail with these, these bumps up here. Well, anyway, it was a physics colloquium. And I was, I was just a, a graduate student. And at, at one point, the speaker showed a picture of a snow crystal like this. And so um, I thought I could ask any old dumb question, and that's what I usually did. Uh, in this one, I, I asked, well, why is this crystal so thin? Well, that wasn't the first to ask this question. In 1611, Johann Kepler asked the same question as monographed New Year's gift concerning six-cornered snow. He also asked, why do they always fall with six corners? Why not with five or seven? Now, I made a great effort to answer this latter question, thinking of the, the, the snow as having some connection with honeycombs, bee honeycombs, and also uh, considering that uh, the snow might be composed of smaller particles that stack together, and they consider the stacking of, of cannonballs. You can see how, how it might uh, give you the idea about uh, forming a hexagon there. Well, this led to this famous conjecture about sphere packing, which wasn't solved until 1998. But uh, he was never satisfied with his answers to this question about six. He never got anywhere on the question about being thin and flat. Um, but the crystal is not always thin and flat. In the 1930s, Uki Chironakia grew the first snow crystals in the lab, growing them on a rabbit hair that he plucked from his collar. Here's a diagram that he came up with. Here's the temperature. And for growth along the water saturation line, which is the supersaturation you have in a cloud of droplets, the crystal habit is thin, very close to zero. It's, we call it tabular. Then there's a sudden transition around minus 4 to the columnar crystal, or pencil-shaped. And then 6 degrees lower, it's back to the tabular regime. And here's where we have the dendrites that uh, we see at the ground. By the way, these, uh, these crystals shown here are what we generally call snow crystals grown at lower supersaturation or lower temperature are generally much smaller. They don't reach the ground. They're either uh, cloud crystals or diamond dust. Uh, the, the basic prismatic crystal is up here. And uh, we call these faces going around the side the prism faces. There are six prism and uh, a top basal and a, and a bottom basal. So that uh, we can say that in the tabular regime here, we have faster prism phase growth. In the columnar regime, we have faster basal. And then back in the uh, this tabular, it's faster prism again. Uh, by the way, when I asked the speaker about the thinness of the crystal, I did get an answer. Uh, the answer given to me was the uh, the the snow crystal is so thin because it, you have faster growth here on the sides. So I thought then that, well, this really isn't so eliminating of an answer. And I hope that uh, the answer I give here is a little bit better. And also, when I later started studying snow, I found that answers given to other common questions about snow also had some deficiency. I think it was George Bernard Shaw who once said, science is a failure, because I can't answer one question without asking 10 more. Well, here's our, here's our first two from Kepler. And um, some other ones that we're going to address here. Why do we have these sharp tabular column transitions? And for dendrites, why do the branches and side branches form? We often hear, well, are there no two alike? Well, a better question is, why do they have so much variety? And because of a recent book, I often hear this question, uh, does, do the crystals really carry messages? Now, I'll admit that you don't need the answers to these to further your research on winter storms. But if you're like me, you probably get asked some of them. 
And so I hope that, that my answers here will help you in that regard. Next, how this crystalline order comes about. 